Okay, why don't you open your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 8, New Testament. Romans chapter 8. And we are going to really dig into three verses, verses 28 through 30, but as you know me, we're going to be going all over the place. So uh, make sure your fingers are loose. Romans chapter 8, okay? Now, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter um, somewhere around 56 AD. Uh, we believe he was in Corinth uh, three months during the winter. And it was there that he wrote this letter to the church in Rome, to the house church in Rome. Now, we believe that uh, the church in Rome was not founded by the Apostle Paul. Instead, it was planted by people who had earlier gone to Jerusalem. They were there for Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. And when the Apostle Peter preached the gospel, remember a lot of people had trusted Jesus, their Lord and Savior? Well, we had a lot of people there. There were a lot of people there from other parts of you know, the known world at that time, people from Rome. We believe that those people who had trusted Christ then went back to Rome and planted this house church. Now, the purpose of Paul writing this letter, unlike many of us other letters, the church in Rome really was not a messed up church. Like some of the other churches, like the church in Galatia, where their doctrine was all messed up. The church in Corinth, where their behavior was all messed up. No, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, number one, as an introduction. He couldn't wait to meet the Christians in Rome. And he says it several times. He said, I can't wait to come see you. I've been held back, but I want to come see you. Well, eventually Paul would end up in Rome. Not once, but twice, in prison. And then about 10 years later, around 65 AD, he would be killed, have his head taken off by the Emperor Nero. But isn't it interesting, in God's sovereignty, he did not allow Paul to go to Rome earlier than that. Instead, God in his grace inspired Paul to write this book, the book of Romans, which is without question one of the most incredible books in all of Scripture in terms of Christian doctrine. And that was really why Paul was writing this letter. The Christians there were doing well. He wanted them to go deeper in doctrine. And, as many of the church fathers have said, the entire Bible is a feast for our soul. But they said that Romans chapter 8 is like the main dish. Why? Because Romans chapter 8 talks about the security of our salvation. And it's interesting, Paul, as he opens up chapter 8 and closes chapter 8, look what, it, what he says here. In verse 1, he says, Therefore, there is now, what's that word? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul starts out chapter 8 by saying, You are secure, Christian, in your salvation. There is now no condemnation in you. No condemnation. And at the end of chapter 8, verse 38, he says, Therefore, there is no loss of salvation. Look what he says. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the what? Love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you see how Paul opens chapter 8? There is now no what? Condemnation. Therefore, you cannot lose your what? salvation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that's what he says in verse 31. No condemnation. Wow. Can't lose my salvation. Wow. What, verse 31, then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What's the answer? No one. Nothing. How much condemnation? Is there an, in Christ, for a Christian in Christ Jesus? None. 
What can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Nothing. What shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who or what can be against us? What's the answer? Nothing, Nothing or no one. Isn't that great? <laughs> But what's very interesting is Paul didn't just make these statements. He then goes on to show us why we are secure in our salvation. We are secure in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you five points of the Holy Spirit here that shows you how secure we are. Look at verses 1 through 4. You're going to see that the Spirit frees us. That's point number one. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, which is the law of faith, the law of faith in Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, which gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is the, is, the, is the law in Adam. It's a law in Adam. We, through our works, cannot earn salvation, right? We, through our works, deserve what? Condemnation. But because of Christ and what he's done for us, the Holy Spirit has set us free from the law functioning in Adam, which is the law of sin and death, and he has given us life in the law of Christ, who has fulfilled the law in our place. And that's why he goes on to say, for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh. The law is okay, but the law is not meant to save us. The law is meant to point us to Christ. And because we have a sin nature, none of us can fulfill God's law. Therefore, what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, God who became man, to be a sin offering. You can just write this down. Old Testament sin offerings were supposed to be unblemished. I love this verse because people say, oh, Christ wasn't perfect. No words to say Christ was perfect in the Bible. Well, right here is a sin offering. He had to be perfect, unblemished, to be offered on our behalf. And so he, the Father, condemned sin in Christ, in his flesh. Why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law, because Christ fulfilled the law perfectly, might be fully met in us, who do not live now according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Number one, we're secure in Christ because of the Holy Spirit. He has freed us. Do you see that point right there? But number two, he has also empowered us. Look at verse five. Those who live according to the flesh, that's the sin nature, have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Watch, watch, watch. Not only does the Spirit free us, the Spirit also empowers us to now walk in obedience to God's law, God's word. Not to earn our salvation, but out of gratitude for our salvation. Does that make sense? He frees us. He empowers us. You know what else he does for us? <laughs> Look at verse 9. He secures us. You, however, talking to Christians, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you're now in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, and they don't belong to Christ... But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to what? Death because of sin. The Spirit gives you what? Life, eternal life because of righteousness, Christ's righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, guess what, Christian? He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life eternal life forever to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Do you see that? The spirit frees us. The spirit empowers us. The spirit secures us. And guess what else the spirit does? He assures us that we're God's children. Look at verses 14 through 16. For those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. 
How do we know we're children of God? The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to what? Sonship. How do we know we're God's children? The spirit, him, and by him, we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Aramaic word for Father. A term of endearment. Isn't that how Jesus prayed to the Father? Abba, Father? It's through the Holy Spirit, we too. We don't fear God as though he's the Godfather anymore. We're not under the law of sin and death. He's our Abba, Father. Because the Spirit has freed us. The Spirit empowers us. The Spirit secures us. And the Spirit assures us that we're God's children. We cry by him, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are what? God's children. But there's one more thing that the Spirit does. Verse 17, he guarantees us glory. Now, if we're God's children, then guess what else we are? We are heirs. That means we receive from the king of kings that which is his. What is his? <laughs> Eternal life, heaven. If we're children of God, guess what? We are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, even if we suffer, we're going to get to that in a few moments, we know that we will share in his glory. So watch, watch, watch. The Spirit, what's the first thing? Frees us. The Spirit, number two, does what? Powers us to walk in the Spirit. Number three, what does the Spirit do? Secures us. Number four, what does the Spirit do? Assures us that we're God's children. And number five, what does the Spirit do? He guarantees your glory. Watch, watch, watch. The Father says it. The Son saves us, and the Spirit secures us. Do you see that? The three persons of the Trinity not only are involved in your salvation, Christian, they are involved in the security of your salvation. If God is for us, who or what can be against us. What's the answer? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing or no one can separate you from the love of Christ. Do you see the point of chapter 8? And that's why Paul goes on to say in verses 28 through 30, which is our main text now, and we know that in some things, a few things? A couple of things? What does he say there? In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For God foreknew, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Why? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Are we ready to go a little deeper right now? We're going to focus on these three verses, and we're going to take a look at, I'll put it on the screen right here, that which we know. Three P words. The promise of God, we know. We also know that it's for the people of God. And we also know the purpose of God for giving us the promise of God. <laughs> okay? So let me kind of start backwards here. Let's look at the purpose. Okay? What is the purpose of our salvation? Well, let's, let's read it again here. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Who have been called according to his what? Purpose. What is God's purpose? purpose. Well, verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. That he might, 
Christ be the firstborn preeminent among many brothers and sisters. You can write this down. What is the purpose of your salvation, Christian? What is the purpose of your salvation being secure? You are going to be conformed into the image of Christ. That is the purpose. Which is interesting. <laughs> you really weren't saved for yourself. <laughs> you were saved for whom? For God. That purpose is conformity to Christ. That purpose is the fellowship of the redeemed in Christ. That purpose is glorification in Christ. Remember last week I spoke to you? That is the goal of why God saved you? To make you, to conform you into the image of Christ. Go with me real quick to Philippians chapter 3. We looked at this last week. The Apostle Paul understood this. Look at Philippians 3.10. Paul understood his purpose, why he was saved, okay? It's a famous book out there, out, out there Purpose Driven Life, bestseller. Guess what? What's the purpose? It's not about you. It's about Christ conforming you into the image, or God conforming you into the image of Christ. That is the purpose. That is the goal of your salvation. And what is the prize, the reward? Paul says, verse 10, I want to know Christ. He goes, I want to know him so much. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to even participate in his sufferings. Becoming like him, even in his death. Because Paul knew what the purpose was. Paul knew what the goal was. And Paul knew what the prize was. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. He knew what he was going through down here on earth was part of that purpose. We're going to see in a few minutes how that applies to us. And he also knew what the prize was. That day, standing before his Lord and Savior, conformed into the image of of Christ and being with him forever. That should be our prize as well. Wouldn't you agree? Over this past week, did you think of that goal? That God saved you and he secured your salvation for the purpose of conforming you to Christ? Did you think about that? Did you think of the prize? One day awaiting you, you will be like Christ. And we know in all things, God works for the good for those who love him and who have been called according to his what? Purpose. Go back to Romans 8, please. So we see the purpose. Now here's the question. Who are the people God does this with? We know that God works in all things for the good, right? But who are the people he does this for? Well, let's read it. Verse 28 again. He works for the good of those who what? Love him. Underline that. Those who have been called, key word, according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also what? Predestined. Go down to verse 30. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Let me break these five words down here for you. Very, very important. We see the promise, right? God works for the good in all things, right? We know the purpose to conform us into the image of Christ, right? 
Who does God do this for? Does he do it for everybody in the world? No, no, no. God does this for those who love him. For those who God foreknew, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. This is often called the progress of salvation. And I'm going to break these five words down for you. You're going to see what Paul, what Paul was saying here. Number one, God works for the good for those he for what? Foreknew. What, what does that word mean? It does not mean God's omniscience. Foreknew means foreloved. Where God, before the foundation of time, set his love upon those he chose. God foreloved you. That's why you can love him. You didn't love God first. How do we know that? Just keep your finger there. Go to 1 John chapter 4. We were in 1 John last week. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Very powerful statement here. This is love. Not that we loved God first. Rather, what? He loved us first. When did he love you first? Before the foundation of time. And then when the time was right, he, God the Father, sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we may live through him. God makes a promise that he will fulfill his purpose for those he foreknew, foreloved. And that's why we who have he foreknew can love him back. Does that make sense? But Romans 8 again, God says he works all things for good. Not for everybody, but for those he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, you guys have all heard that term predestination, right? How do you feel when you hear that word? Confused? Angry? I don't want to know anything about it. Well, you have to understand, you cannot get around that word in the Bible. The question is, who did God for? God predestined, right? But on which basis? God foreloved, God predestined, based upon what? Based upon his omniscience, knowing that we would turn to him and love him, and therefore God said, I'll forelove you and I'll predestine you. Is that true? It's not true. How do we know that? Paul tells us in Romans 8. Just go over a couple verses. Look at verses 5 through 8. Paul puts an end to that speculation. He says, those who live according to the flesh, the sin nature, have their minds set on what the flesh, sin nature, desires. But those who live according to the Spirit, those who are filled with the Spirit, indwelled by the Spirit, safe and secure by the Spirit, we have our minds set on what the Spirit desires. Watch this now. The mind governed by the flesh, the sin nature. Who's he talking about here? Believers? No, non-believers. Look how God defines non-believers. The mind governed by the flesh is what? Death. Eternal damnation. But the mind governed by the spirit is life, eternal life, peace, peace with God through Christ. The mind, verse 7, governed by the flesh is 
One day we'll turn and love God. What does it say? Is hostile to God. Will never choose God. Can never choose God. In fact, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh, completely led by the sin nature, non-believers, what are those three words? Cannot please God. We know the promise. God works all things for good. We know the purpose to conform us into the image of Christ. And we know the people God makes this promise to. Those whom he foreknew, foreloved, are those he predestined. The Greek word means marked out, predetermined. And the basis of God's forelove and predetermined decision to choose his people had absolutely nothing to do with us. Because apart from God choosing us, we all, because we come into this world with a sin nature separated from God, Scripture says we're hostile to God. And we cannot choose God nor even please God. So it's not like God before the foundation of time said, you know what? I'm going to choose Tom. Because I know that down the corridors of life, there's going to be a day when Tom comes to his own senses. And even though he was living a, a, a life apart from me and against me and hostile to me, I know that Tom's going to be a good enough moral person and come to his senses and suddenly, boom, turn to me. And you know what? Then I'll choose Tom based on that. No. God's choice of you, Christian, is not because of you. It is in spite of you. It is all his love. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us first. When? Before the foundation of time. He not only foreloved you, he forechose you, predestined to save you, marked you out, set you apart. Before the foundation of time. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's break this down further. Let's take a look at this word predestination. Look at verse 4. Again, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Ephesus and he talks about God the Father. He says, He chose us in him when? Before the creation of the world. Why? To be holy and blameless in his sight. Do you see the purpose? We're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. How do you explain this? Two words. In love. Do you see the love? For love. In love, what did he do, guys? He predestined us. Why? For adoption to sonship. How? Through Jesus Christ. Whose choice was it? Was it? It was in accordance with his pleasure and will. And as a result, it is to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one God the Son he loves. Go down to verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, that's God the Father, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Do you see that? God the Father 
has chosen you. Guess what God the Son has done? Look at verse 7. He has redeemed you. In Him, Christ, we have redemption. He purchased us from that hostile position, that state where we were walking by the sin nature and wanted nothing to do with God. He purchased us. How? With His precious blood. What did we receive? The forgiveness of sins. How did that happen? In accordance with the riches of God's grace, which he lavished on us, that love, with all wisdom and understanding. The Father chooses, the Son redeems, and the Holy Spirit seals and secures. Go down to the second part of verse 13. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Who is this mark, this seal, who seals us for salvation, secures our salvation? The promised Holy Spirit. Who else? Who is a deposit, here it is, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession and our only response is to the praise of His glory. Do you see it? God the Father foreknew you, foreloved you. He predestined you. He chose you. God the Son, 2,000 years ago, went to the cross for those whom God forechose, foreknew and predestined, and He paid, was punished with the sins, paid the price, poured out His blood so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And those who have been chosen, those who have been redeemed, God the Holy Spirit comes inside, lives in us, seals us, frees us from the law of sin and death, right? Empowers us now to walk by the Spirit and obey God's Word. Secures us, secures us. We can't lose our salvation. He assures us that we're God's children and He guarantees us glory in heaven. Does that make sense? So, we know the promise, right? God works all things for good. We know the purpose. What's the ultimate good? To be conformed into the image of Christ. Who does God do this for? The people of God. Who are the people of God? Those whom God foreloved, predestined, he also what? Called. How does he call people? Well, we read right here, it's the first part of 13. And you also were included in Christ. When? When you heard the message of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation. So many people say, you know what? One day I had a vision and I, Jesus showed up and just kind of hugged me and that's when I started trusting Jesus. No. Well, you know, I just, I don't know, I just started thinking of Jesus and I just said, I believe. No. How do you believe? Well, first of all, God has to choose you. <laughs> but it's through the call of the gospel. The proclamation of the bad news and good news. That's why I preach it all the time. Because it's God's divine means to call people whom he predestined and foreloved. And what is the gospel? Well, go to chapter 2. Paul breaks it down very clearly here. I love this. Paul says, let me give you some bad news. He says, let me tell you how lovely you were in God's sight. As for you, you were what? Dead. In your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Who is the leader of this world? The ruler of this world. The ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Do you see that? Who's the spirit who's now at work in this world? Begins with a D. Devil. Devil. So you come into this world spiritually D. What's the D word? Dead. Dead. Unbeknownst to you, you are following who? Devil. The Devil. And the result is, the end of that verse, you are D what? Disobedient. Sinful in God's sight. Not only that, let's go to the fourth D. All of us, by the way, Paul says, every person came to the world this way. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying our flesh, the sin nature. 
and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving God's wrath. We were damned. Beautiful news, isn't it? We come into this world dead to God. We're following the devil. We're disobedient to God. And we're under the wrath of God, we're damned. And we have no clue. Pretty bad news, isn't it? And there's nothing we can do through our, our own efforts to get out from under that. Because we saw in Romans 8, the person in this situation, which was all of us, we are hostile to God. We won't submit to God's laws, nor can we. A person in this situation cannot please God. Should I just close in prayer right now? Look at verse 4, the good news. But, <laughs> because of his great what? Look at me, love for love. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. Christian, it is by grace you have been saved. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that nobody can boast. God, in his forelove for us, predestined his chosen people. And by God's grace, there was a time when God called you out of darkness, out of the prison of Satan. And he called you through the gospel. You needed to understand the bad news before you would be willing to even consider the good news. The good news that God the Father, 2,000 years ago, sent God the Son to this earth. Unlike us, Jesus was born without a sin nature. Lived a life God and man. Fully God, fully man. And when the time was right, he allowed himself to go to the cross. And it was there that God the Father and his love for us, all that hostility we had towards God, all that sin we committed against God, all that disobedience we committed against God, God the Father put those sins on Jesus, punished Jesus in our place as a sin offering. God the Father poured out his wrath, that wrath that was meant for us, he redirected and poured it out on his son. The forces of hell, eternal damnation, the wrath of God that was meant for me, was meant for you, was poured out on him. For us, who were hostile to God, could not please God, would not please God, could never choose God, because we were dead to God. Jesus died, but three days later he rose from the dead, overcoming sin and death for us. And through the gospel proclamation, God in his grace, through his Holy Spirit, opened your eyes and suddenly you go, I get it. Oh yeah, I need salvation. And the Holy Spirit draws you to Christ, seals your salvation, guaranteeing your glory. That's why I present the gospel all the time. Because I don't know those whom God foreknew, forechose. I don't know who God predestined. But I know that God works through the gospel to bring people from spiritual death to spiritual life by His grace. Does that make sense? Now, you ready to get a little doctor doctrinal right now? Go back to Romans. Now, this is very interesting here. Again, Romans 8.30, we know that uh, 
those who have been predestined, or actually God foreknew, verse 29, he predestined, why? We know the purpose, to be conformed to the image of the Son. Those he, verse 30, predestined, he also called, how? Through the proclamation of the what? Gospel. Those he called, he also what? Justified. Very key word here. Because if you don't understand this word, if you don't understand the doctrine of justification, guess what? You don't have security in your salvation. You're not sure if you're going to go to heaven. Let me show you what I mean. The doctrine of, of justification is a legal declaration by God where God declares us not guilty because of Christ and His righteousness and God also declares us righteous in His sight. Does that make sense? It's a declaration, a legal one time instantaneous declaration where God says, you know what, Yosef, you're not guilty because of my son. Not only that, Yosef, when I see you, I think of you as righteous as my son. That's the doctrine of justification. The word justification is the opposite of condemnation. Condemnation is God's declaration where he declares us what? Guilty. He declares us unrighteous in his sight. And we have to pay the penalty for that, which is eternal damnation. Do you understand? And Paul started out Romans 8 by saying, there is now no, what's the word? Condemnation. For whom? Those who are in Christ Jesus. Who are those people? Those whom God foreknew, predestined, called. They are justified. Now, you need to understand what this means because there's a lot of confusion on this. In fact, I'm going to give you two theological words. You have what's called infused righteousness of Christ and you also have imputed righteousness of Christ. I'm going to get a little seminary professor on you here. The Catholic Church believes that God grants you the righteousness of Christ, it is an infused righteousness. As though God places the righteousness of Christ in you. And it varies in measure. In other words, this righteousness of Christ starts the process. But you have to do the rest. That's why you see a lot of times people have to go to Mass. Because if they don't, they fall out of what's called the state of grace. The grace in, their, in this theology varies. So you're not sure when Paul says there's no condemnation, you, they're not sure. When Paul says you can't lose your salvation, they're not sure. Christ, through what he did on the cross, opened the door to grace. His righteousness is infused, placed in, but you've got to come alongside and do the rest. Obviously, with the power of Christ. It's more of an infused righteousness, a moral righteousness. And again, what happens when a person in the Catholic Church usually dies? The priest performs what? Last rites. Not sure. The family's not sure if there's no new condemnation in that person. Make sense? Now, the traditional Protestant or evangelical position is that Christ's righteousness is not infused in us, placed in us, rather it is imputed, credited to us. Now, let me just be very clear here. Many Protestants don't know this. 
And that's why many Protestants, like many Catholics, are not sure of their salvation. In fact, one of the largest movements in the Protestant movement is the Charismatic Pentecostal movement. About 500 million people worldwide. Many of whom, most of whom probably, are not sure of their salvation. That's why you see a ton of altar calls. That's why you see people feeling they've lost their salvation on all kinds of crazy stuff. The doctrine of justification, according to the scriptures, shows us that Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us, credited to us, so that when God the Father looks at you, he thinks of you covered with the righteousness of Christ. Christ who fulfilled the law perfectly. Christ who paid for your sins perfectly. Go to Romans chapter 4 here. Look what scripture says here. Two Old Testament examples. Paul says, what then shall we say, verse 1, that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter, this matter of justification. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by what? Works? Then he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was, what's the word? Credited to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 16, way back in the Bible. How was Abraham saved? Through the imputed righteousness of God, where, where Abraham believed in what Christ would do. And as a result, Christ's righteousness was imputed to Abraham, credited to Abraham's account. And he was justified before God. What about King David? Look at verse 4. Now, when one works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who what? Justifies the ungodly. How interesting is that? God justifies the ungodly. Why? We're all ungodly. <laughs> we all come into this world that way. God who justifies the ungodly, their faith, what's that word? Is credited to them as righteousness. David, King David said the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Do you understand the doctrine of justification? God does not declare you not guilty because of you. But he does because he sees the righteousness of his son imputed unto you, credited to your account. Was Jesus guilty? No. So God the Father looks at you, thinks of you, says not guilty. How does he declare you righteous? Not because of you but because of the righteousness of his son credited to you. Go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Look what Paul says here. Great verse here on righteousness. God made him, that's God the Father, made him, God the Son, who had no sin, be sin for us. Why? So that in him, in Christ, we, the sinners, might become the what? Righteousness of God. Go one more. Philippians. Then we'll go back to Romans. Philippians. There's a reason why I'm making this case. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Look what Paul says here, starting in verse 7. We'll go 7 through 9. Paul says, 
But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He's talking about his old life before Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, he said, that I may gain Christ. How, Paul? I want to be found in him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. He goes, I don't want infused righteousness. I want imputed righteousness. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith in Christ. Those God foreknew he predestined. He called them through the gospel and they were justified, declared not guilty, and declared righteous. Not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ imputed unto us. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Nothing or no one can separate us from the love of God in Christ. What shall we say to this? If God is for us, who or what can be against us? Do you understand the theology? And then the final one, Romans 8. Those God foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, and I love this one. He also what? Glorified. This is very interesting. In the Greek, he says it is something that already happened, and it carries all the way throughout eternity. In other words... <laughs> Those God foreknew before the foundation of time. He guaranteed to justify them and glorify them. Christian, in a very real sense, you're not only justified, you're also already glorified. You will be conformed into the image of Christ. And you are guaranteed glorification with Christ. It's a guarantee. Well, look what Paul says here. Stay right there in chapter 8. Look what he says here. I love this. <laughs> I love this. And look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has what? Chosen. What's the answer? no one. Why? It is God who justifies. Look what he goes on to say. Who then, I love this in verse 34, is the one who condemns? What's the answer? No one. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Christ Jesus who died, who was condemned for us. More than that, he was raised to life. And guess what he's doing right now, Christian, for you? He is at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for you. You know why? Because those God foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, and you will be glorified. Because God the Son is standing next to the Father and the Son is praying for you when you sin and you will. He says, Father, no charge against Tom, no charge against Vedran, no charge against Robert, no charge against Norma. I was already condemned in their place. There's no condemnation in them. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? Father chose you. The son's praying for you. Oh, guess who else is praying for you? Uh, look real quick up here. Look at verse 26 through 27. In the same way, the Spirit 
helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Watch this. Because the Spirit intercedes for whom? God's people in accordance with the will of God. Melanie, what's the purpose of God for saving you? To conform you to the image of whom? Christ. Guess what? You're going to stumble. But God the Son is interceding for you. God the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. So watch. <laughs> God the Father says, there's no condemnation in you if you're in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from my love for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what God the Father says. God the Son saves you and is praying for you. God the Holy Spirit secures you and is praying for you. You have the three persons of the Trinity for you. Who or what can possibly be against you? No one. That's why we now can trust in the promise. And what is the promise? Real simple. In all things, God works for what? Good. For whom? For whom? There you go. Verses 29 and 30 tell us. What's the purpose? To be like Christ. Do you see the promise? And who it's for? And what the purpose is? And do you see why I went through this meticulously? For this part. Because if you don't understand the stuff prior to, this promise is going to be, oh, okay. Because most every Christian knows that verse, that promise. But why is it most Christians don't have the security of their salvation? So let's break this down real quick and we'll finish. Did you guys know the promise so well? God says, in all things. It's very interesting. In all things. Christian, do you realize... By the way, what's the purpose? To make you like Christ. Those he justified, he already also what? Glorified. Guess what? In all things in between, no matter what pain you're going through, no matter how many problems you have, no matter your trials, your tribulations, no matter the anxiety you're dealing with, no matter what, do you see how far reaching this promise is? All things. God works for the good. God will fulfill that which he promised. You will, you will be conformed to the image of Christ. God works in all things. But it's interesting, we also see the word God works, right? God's the source of this. Do you see how far reaching it is? Now let me give you a Greek word, the word for works. It actually is synergai. And that's where we get our word synergy from. And the way it's structured is, what it says is, God works together in all things. There's a divine dynamic synergy that is occurring in all things in your life right now. In good things, even in bad things. Anybody have any bad things going on right now? There's a divine dynamic synergy. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working together for the good in all things. Which is interesting for those who say, well, God just wound up the universe and doesn't get involved. This is very clear. God's involved. Praise God he's involved. We don't believe in 
the, or deism, where God just wound up the universe and he stays back. We believe God's in control. He is actively involved with his universe. He is actively involved with his children who he's chosen. So, we know something, Christian, in all things. There's a divine synergy working, right? And what is the result? Good. Kind of good. Well, there's really two main words in the Greek for goodness. The first one is kalos. It means like outward goodness. Kind of superficial. You look good on the outside. Interestingly, the word Paul used for good here is the word agathos, which is inward, deep, ultimate good from the inside out. Christian, in all things, God is working for your ultimate, deepest, highest good here on earth to glorification. And you know that that promise is for you. Those who God foreknew, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. And you know what the purpose is. No matter what is going on in your life, God will work and is working this dynamic, divine synergy for your ultimate good and glory. Which means, is God working for your ultimate good in the midst of suffering? Go to 1 Peter 5.10. Let's see what Peter says about this. First Peter 5, 10 and 11. You remember Peter? The guy who denied Christ three times? Look what he has to say about suffering and how God works for the ultimate good. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, God himself through his divine synergy will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast to him be the power forever and ever. Is there anybody suffering here right now? Guess what? <laughs> God is at work and it will be your ultimate good. God even works good for through suffering. How about through sin? Does God work good through sin? Go to Psalm 119. This is great. Look at Psalm 119. Look at verse 67. Look what King David, uh, King David, did he sin at all? Yeah. Yeah. Did God work it for ultimate good? Because didn't David say something in Romans 4? We talked about justification because he knew that his righteousness was, Christ's righteousness was credited to him. Right? <laughs> look, look what David said. David said in verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went where? Astray. Anybody go astray from God lately? But now, he says, what does he do? I go, I obey your word. He says, I obey your word. Look what he says down in verse 71. He goes, it was good for me to be afflicted. What, Paul? He goes, yeah, God worked it for the ultimate good. So that I might learn your decrees. So we see that God works ultimate good through suffering. God works ultimate good even through sin. Now, I'm not saying God wants you to sin. I'm not saying there's not consequences for sin. Not eternal consequences because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. But 
even in sin, in all things, God divinely and dynamically synergizes everything for your ultimate, deepest, highest good. So we see he does it for suffering. He does it in sin, through sin, with sin, not through sin, but when we sin. How about when it comes to Satan? Go to Job chapter 23. Job's a little bit before the Psalms. 23. Look at verse 10. Now, you guys remember Job. Who tempted Job? Satan. The forces of hell came against Job. And look what Job says in 23.10. But he, God, knows the way I take. When he, God, has what? Tested me. What did Satan do? Tempted. What did God turn the temptation to? A test. Why? Because God synergizes all things for what? Ultimate good for those who love God and who have been chosen according to his purpose. And look what Job says. But he knows the way I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as what? Gold. <laughs> God guarantees your salvation. He chose you. He secures you. He guarantees it. And he will work for good. Not simply kalos, outward good that looks good on the outside. He works deeper. Agathos, the deepest, most ultimate, highest good for your life, Christian. Here on earth to heaven. He works through suffering. He works through sin. He even works through Satan. That's why Romans chapter 8, and we'll close it here. The Apostle Paul, after giving this deep doctrine in verses 1 through 30, he now concludes with a hymn of praise. What then shall we say in response to watch me these things, if God is for us, who or what is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us what? All things. Whom will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life. He is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. As it is written, quoting Psalm 44, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But regardless, he says in verse 37, no, in all these things, watch me, all these things, we are more than conquerors. How? Through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he said, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, even the forces of hell, Christian, cannot stop God's promise, cannot thwart God's purpose for you, God's chosen people. And Paul says, neither height nor death nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. there you go. That's why Romans 8 is the main dish.
Christian, you are secure in your salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your authoritative word that has taught us, Lord, about your incredible love for us, not because of us, God, but in spite of us. And we thank you, God, that you foreloved us. Who are we, God, that you would do this for us? All we can do is praise you and thank you and worship you. God, the Son, in the same way, who are we that you would be punished and condemned in our place? Who are we that you would be at the right hand of the Father interceding for us all the time? And God, the Holy Spirit, who are we that you would secure our salvation? That you would assure us we're God's children? That you would guarantee our final glory? And God Almighty, thank you that in all things, even the things we're facing today, yesterday, this past week, you are at work, divinely synergizing everything for your ultimate good and glory. God, thank you so much for your encouragement. God, thank you so much for this deep theology. Of course, it's just going to lead us to a higher praise and doxology. And yet, as I say that, I realize there may be some people sitting here who have never felt secure in their salvation, maybe even didn't even know if they were saved. And my friend, if that's you, if today you've heard the call of God through the proclamation of the gospel, and if you're feeling the, the, the pull of the Holy Spirit saying it's time to come into God's family, then right where you're sitting right now, with an honest heart and mind, you can simply repeat these words and say, Dear Jesus, I recognize that I have lived a hostile life towards God. I've been disobedient. I've sinned. And I realize I deserve the wrath of God. Eternal damnation. And I know there's nothing I can do through my own works to get out from under this. But God, I thank you for your love for me. That in spite of me, you have chosen to make your love made known to me today. To help me to truly understand who Jesus is. And that he went to that cross and was punished in my place for my sins. Died the death that I deserve. But three days later, rose from the dead, paying for my sins in full. And dear Jesus, I now come to you. I turn away from thinking I can make myself right in God's sight through my own efforts, and I turn to you, Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins. Please grant me the free gift of eternal life. Please credit to my life your perfect righteousness. My friend, if you've come to Jesus in that way, if you've truly come to him in that way, God is a God of mercy and love. And he saves sinners. He saves people who were hostile to him. He is a God who justifies and says we are not guilty. We are righteous because of the righteousness of the Christ and we thank you, God. Lord, as we now conclude our service in song, May we, like Paul, now that we've learned deep theology, lift up our hearts, our minds, and our voices to you in high praise and doxology, praising you, God, for your faithfulness and for our security of salvation. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said...